Hello everyone, my name is Michael Homer, and I wanted to talk to you today about pregnancy loss. First, I'd like to thank everyone for joining the BEAT Infertility Summit uh, here during the National Infertility Awareness Week. Um, my name is Michael Homer. I'm one of the docs who works at Reproductive Science Center in the Bay Area. Um, I work specifically down in the South Bay, San Jose, and Los Gatos area. And I want to talk to you about pregnancy loss today. Um, I know it's not an easy topic to talk about, um, but it's something that affects a lot of women. So today I want to talk to you about what we, what we know and what we don't know, which is also important to know, and what we can do about it. Um, so just right off from the onset of talking about this, I just wanted to say that as a provider, all providers in this field understand, and most people you know, around who aren't providers know that this is a really hard topic. Pregnancy loss is something that a lot of women experience, but not a lot of women talk about. And if you've done any sort of reading or reviewing about this topic, you, you hear that over and over again. And you think at this point that, and, and I, I feel like it's becoming a little bit more, um, it's, it's loosening up a little bit and people are, are opening up a little bit more, which is really great and a really healthy thing to do. Um, but, but I know it's hard. And so hopefully this lecture or this sort of talk today will give you a slightly better, um, just, a, just a general guideline or framework to kind of how, how we approach this, right? Because a lot of things are not in your control. This, this, no one would ever choose to, to, to have a pregnancy loss um, for a desired pregnancy. And this isn't in your control, but understanding a little bit more about kind of how myself as a physician thinks about it and how we try to work it up and, and help our patients, I think can at least give you some sense of control as well and a sense of peace to know kind of what these next steps may or may not be or what the possible causes are. I would tell everyone right from the beginning that I'm going to talk about a lot of things that we know, but remember my title is also what we don't know, and that's a lot. Up to 75% of causes of recurrent pregnancy loss, which is defined varyingly, um, don't have a reason. And we don't find one. And so there's still ways to help. There's what we can do about it part, but we may not necessarily always know what the 100% reason is for that. And that's a part that um, is sometimes hard to, to kind of take it. Um, the reason why also it's hard to talk about is because there is multiple different ways of defining it. So pregnancy loss, miscarriage, right? Um, we, the medical term is recurrent pregnancy loss and miscarriages are normal. So about 10% um, of women in their twenties will experience one between 30 and 35, about 15%, 35 to, nine, 35 to 39 years old, about 25% of pregnancies. And when, when a woman is pregnant over the age of 40, on average over the age of 40, there's a spectrum there, but about almost up to 50% maybe result unfortunately in losses. And we, and this is clinically recognized pregnancies, right? Maybe there's some that are not clinically recognized. And so miscarriages are natural and they're normal. They're terrible and, you know, um, and awful, but, but it is normal. So when we talk about recurrent pregnancy loss, what we try to say is, well, if we know it's something's normal, how many times before it becomes not normal? And we, we, you know, we use math. And what we know is that all women trying to conceive, for a woman to have two consecutive losses in a row affects about 2% of the population. Now that doesn't, that takes into account all women trying. So 20 year olds and 40 year olds. And what we know is that age, when age increases, as I just kind of said that my little statistics there, then the chance of miscarriage. So when I see that 2% of women will experience two consecutive losses, I am always surprised because in my clinic as a fertility doctor here in the Bay area, I see a lot of women who have, you know, two losses, three, sometimes even higher. And um, so to me, I feel like more of the population has this, but obviously I'm seeing a select, you know, certain population population. Um, it's just that, um, so, so some places will say, or societies or guidelines or papers will say three miscarriages in a row of a clinically recognized pregnancy. But as time has gone on and the tests that we do know are not that arduous or expensive, we, and most organizations now will say, if you've had two in a row, 
and we're talking about 2% of the population for desired pregnancies, then let's do the workup at that point. Like that's kind of a trigger now to do the workup. The more losses one has, the more likely it's not going to be due to chance. And so therefore the a little bit more likely that one of the tests that we will run will show up with something that we can do to fix it. Though still 50 to 75% of the time, we're not gonna find something. Um, so we do know that the majority of chromosomes excuse me, majority of the miscarriages are caused because the chromosomes are not being balanced. That's not something that you're responsible for. Most, almost all miscarriages, you're not, you didn't do something wrong. A lot of people sometimes will say, well, you know, did I exert myself? I've had patients ask me, did I play video games too hard? Did I get too excited? Um, whatever you happen to be around the time of the miscarriage, people will try to find a pattern. We're humans, we're good at that. Um, so it's my job, you know, to help you with this lecture and maybe in the office to kind of figure out what, what do we really know from all the collective experience of all these women that have had these losses. So when patients come into my office, I try to break it down to say, look, there's three main reasons that, that might be responsible for recurrent pregnancy loss that is not associated with random uh, errors in the eggs or sperm that can lead to the chromosomes not being balanced. So the first one is going to be looking at the an anatomy. And so with the anatomy, we think of things inside the uterus. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you um, a video right now um, on my desktop. I'm just going to draw it out to talk about the different types of um, things that we might find in the uterus. I thought it might be a little bit more useful to kind of just draw it out. Um, so when we look at the uterus, especially on the inside, that's what we're really focused on because that's where the pregnancy is going to be, right? And so first what we look at is that polyps. Polyps are just these extra little growths that one can sort of have on the inside. So if you think of the little skin tags that we all have um, on our skin, and these little, they're not necessarily bad um, in terms of cancer or masses, but they, they're a bother, they shouldn't be there. And so the lining of the uterus can also have this extra growth. Now the actual causes for it, the specific reasons, we don't really know, just some people are polypy. And that's why we look inside with doing, and I'll describe that a little bit later, but polyps are small, also little toxic factories that can release cytokines or inflammatory markers. So not only is it bad real estate to land on, but it also can cause a disruption in the harmony of implantation. So if I then also look at fibroids, so fibroids you probably have heard of, and those are benign muscle growths that one can see when we look at um, uh, ultrasounds and uh, with MRIs as well. And so the location of fibroids is really important. So in basics, you can get fibroids in three different main locations, okay? So the first one I drew that's on the inside, that is a submucosal fibroid, but that is one that is budding into the cavity where the baby's gonna be. That, if you thought the polyps are bad for a factory, these are the mega factories, okay? They produce so much cytokines and signals that can disrupt the flow of the implantation that it's not, again, just bad real estate where they are. They also can cause a disruption even if the embryo doesn't land on that spot, but somewhere else that's nearby. Um, so those are two main sort of anatomical growths that can come. Now, a septum, a septum, let's see how quick I can be with this drawing here. A septum is where, if I'm looking at the side profile, we actually have the uterine wall and it'll come down. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of fill in this part. This is the muscle part of the fiber, the septum. Okay, excuse me, the fibrous area in the septum. And so now this area right here, this is not a good location for an embryo to implant. It's poorly vascularized. It also does have inflammatory markers there as well. And so it can be a bad landing spot for any embryo. Now, a septum has to be of a significant length and significant within uterus is about half of its length or almost close to that, like 40% or so to be kind of a, probably be a major factor. 
Lots of women can have small septums in their uterus or even arcuates, and those haven't really been associated with pregnancy losses, but these large ones can, okay? And later on, I'll talk about how this, these things can be fixed, specifically looking at, you know, surgeries. And then the last part of anatomy that could be an issue is uh, if a woman has had any instrumentation in the uterus, such as a DNC, a dilation curatage, maybe after a, a loss. And we're talking about, you know, if you're talking about uh, these are patients, and you are, might be a patient who's had losses and a little bit higher chance of having a DNC. Most first trimester DNCs by far are totally fine to do. And if that's what you have to do for your treatment, you should listen to your doctor and do it. But sometimes the scraping on the inside can cause intrauterine adhesions. And when that can just, if you go inside, you'll look, you'll see little connections. Either they're thick or they're wispy. Sometimes you'll sort of see, I'm going to draw this a little bit, a little messy here, I apologize. But a lot of the cavity will just kind of be obliterated. And what we have is a smaller cavity. Typically, though, with surgery, one can, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, one can release the adhesions of, of those and with special techniques and balloons and hormones and other things, restore the uh, uterus back to its normal anatomic shape. So those are just, I won't torture too much longer with the drawings, but so there's just some of, some of the um, more common anatomical reasons for why someone may have recurring pregnancy losses. Okay, so now that we talked about the anatomy, let's talk about the genetic, possible genetic causes. We've already talked about the most common one, and that's random errors in the chromosomes. So that when the egg or the sperm divide and do the thing that they're supposed to do in order so they can get ready to meet, a lot of times the chromosomes, the data, the information doesn't divide evenly. And so you have too much information in that egg or not enough information in that egg. Same with the sperm as well. And so when they go and meet together and create an embryo, that embryo doesn't have the right amount of information, whether it has too much or too little. A lot of those will lead to miscarriages. Some of those will also, you won't even know that you're pregnant. Maybe it was a negative pregnancy test. The embryo had actually formed for a little while, but then stopped. <clears throat> Some of them are also, that's where Down syndrome comes from. So some of them are compatible with life or a further long pregnancy and then a miscarriage. The one that we're talking about that's a bit more we're looking in recurrent pregnancy loss is chromosome rearrange, chromosomal rearrangement. And that's not a random error about from, you, from a patient's egg or another patient's sperm. It's actually from them, them their genetic makeup themselves. And so we look to see, because sometimes some people will have the right amount of information, but it's rearranged um, and it's called a translocation. Mm -hmm. They have different names to them for the different types that they are. But if you can sort of imagine that when the DNA is line up, and so you've got the side from your mom and the side from your dad, when they cross over, if you look at your own, you might see that a portion and this happened way, way back when you were an embryo, you know, back first forming. And one of the pieces some from this chromosome might have attached itself on to an extra chromosome, okay? So now you have a piece, an extra piece here on this chromosome, and then this one lost that piece and it's over here now. And so I have a truncated or smaller chromosome that's missing information. And I have a chromosome over here that has the normal chromosome and then the extra piece of information that I was missing from here. But then when they line up in order to go to become an egg or a sperm, you now every once you will line up and you might have one normal and then one that's truncated. And so and it splits and then every, and then one egg will get, you know, uh, will get the one that's missing and one might get the normal. And then the other one that has the full piece with the extra, that lines up with another one that's normal. And then some eggs get a normal one and some eggs get that extra piece of information. And so if it happens that the extra piece of information goes over to the egg that the same one that has the missing piece goes over to, sorry, this way, then you have the balanced information, right? And so the embryo doesn't care where 
the information is. It just needs the, like the code. And so if it's balanced, then it's fine. And that's who that person is. But they have a high chance of possibly passing on if they just pass down the extra piece, but not the missing part or the missing part and not the extra piece, then they're unbalanced. And then those embryos sometimes can lead to conditions like um, a Down syndrome, but typically result in miscarriages or losses. And so that's also something that we look at. There's two different types, Robertsonian and reciprocal. Um, reciprocal is on specific types, and but they're all, and has different odds for that. But Robertsonian is, uh, sorry, apologize, reciprocal is what I described. That means about half of the um, eggs and or sperm produced would not be balanced. Robertsonian is a slightly different way where um, chromosomes that are, um, will actually merge. And that's about two thirds of those eggs or sperm produced by that person will be abnormal. And so, um, so that's another possible cause for a current pregnancy loss. Another one I mentioned as well, the next category is autoimmune. And so autoimmune is, and we'll talk about that and the sort of what we, what we don't know, but there's one specific type of autoimmune disorder that's called acquired. There's inherited and there's acquired, right? Now autoimmune in general will always be acquired, right? And so acquired means that your body has this natural ability to, to learns to fight itself. And that's when the immune system kind of goes a little haywire. Now, um, and I should try to correct that. There's acquired and there's inherited causes for blood clotting thrombophilia. So there's one that, so there's some where people have inherit a genetic risk for blood clots, mm -hmm. and there's others where people um, acquire that. And so the one I'm going to talk to you about is an autoimmune, and it is an acquired uh, thrombophilia or pro-coagulant uh, condition. It's called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And it's where it affects up to, sorry about that, it's where it affects up to about 15% of patients with recurrent pregnancy loss. Um, and this is something where when the pregnancy is implanting, this is the theory behind it, that if you have something that pro, as pro clotting, that the placenta lands, well, the embryo lands and the placenta's there, and it's trying to essentially implant and grow in, the embryo is actually trying to bury itself down into the soft, fluffy lining. Well, if, and then grow blood vessels in order to create that connection and grow that placenta. If there's a problem with there because those blood vessels are impacted, they can't grow very fast or cleanly because the blood is clotting a little bit faster, platelets are kind of blocking it off, then that can cause an inability for the pregnancy to attach well and can lead possibly to first trimester losses. And so again, it's called antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. Um, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the test that you need for that, but that's another possible cause. Lastly, the other causes um, where people will also look at it, well, sorry, with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, there are other clinical indications that might make you sort of trigger to know this. I just, I'm gonna read them out loud I just want to be able to hear it like at least once, okay? We talked about multiple losses, right? So the definition for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is, and I'm going to read it here, is for three unexplained consecutive spontaneous pregnancy losses that are less than 10 weeks of gestation. We will still do the workup after two losses, but that's technically the definition. But there are other definitions. If you've had um, one preterm delivery of a normal infant before 30 weeks of gestation because of severe preeclampsia, which is high blood pressure, or seizures, which is called eclampsia, or maybe other forms or features consistent with placental insufficiency, such as the low fluid or small birth weight, or if you've had an unexplained fetal death as an intrauterine fetal demise that's greater than 10 weeks of gestation. That's a possibility that triggers a workup maybe for recurrent pregnancy loss. You also need then to have, or if you've had pregnancy losses 
associated with either lab values, which I'll talk to you about the test that we do, it's a simple blood test, or if you yourself have had an event for blood clots. Those are also possible reasons why. So I just want to make sure that you've heard that at least once, because sometimes someone might have had that in the past and they've just kind of not necessarily chalked that up to recurrent pregnancy loss workup or at least antiphospital with antibody syndrome. Um, and so in the last two, the last couple of things that we will always check is that if you have an out of control thyroid, if you have hidden but out of control diabetes, or if your hormone, which is called prolactin, is out of order, is too high, those are other things or hormones or imbalance that could possibly be associated with miscarriages. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is talk about what do we do about it now that we know, right? And so when we think of the anatomic, we have to go look at the uterus. And that can be done pretty simply, okay? I say simple, but sometimes it involves a small procedure. Um, but the first thing is to do a saline infused sonogram or a sonohistogram. We love three letter acronyms in fertility. So it's going to be um, SIS, sono, uh, saline infused sonogram, or it's gonna be sonohistogram, which is SHG. So you'll see these three letter alphabet soups everywhere. Um, what this is and what they are is that done in the office takes five minutes um, using a speculum doesn't it it's a little crampy there's pressure but it doesn't shouldn't hurt a small little flexible catheter is placed through the cervix into the uterus and a little bit of water is placed in the uterus using an ultrasound that water will look black but the uterine uh insides will look gray so as the uterus with an ultrasound so you've seen that picture of an ultrasound if we put a little bit of water inside then we can see the profile of the entire uterus. And so for instance, here at RSC, we have a 3D ultrasound and we can do a sweep basically and do a create the model of what the uterus looks like inside to make sure there aren't any lumps or bumps, you know, polyps, fibroids. If there's a septum, we can measure, we have a nice 3D picture so we can measure exactly how long that is because that plays a role in what we're looking at, okay? Um, and so, we also would do the blood testing that we talked about for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And this is where um, we would, it's a simple blood test, okay? And what we're looking for is um, three tests, anti-cardiolipid antibody, beta-2 microglobulin, and looking for lupus anticoagulant. And no, that's a mouthful, um, but those are three specific um, antibodies that we're checking that are associated with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. We will check a thyroid. We will check a hemoglobin A1C, which is a sugar check. We'll check a prolactin as well, just to make sure that those are okay. And remember the genetic testing that we talked about, the chromosomal imbalance? So both partners will get a karyotype, which is to check to make sure that we have all of the, um, all the chromosomes are not uh, Sorry, not, um, sorry, uh, to make sure that the chromosomes are all lined up the way that they're supposed to be and there isn't any uh, reciprocal unbalanced areas, okay, or translocations, that was the word I was looking for, sorry. Um, so the other thing that we will look at too, okay, so those covers the things that we know, but there are other things that are associated but not necessarily potentially causative. Every person that comes in this clinic will always get a couple other factors. We'll check it through a varying reserve. So even though a woman is younger, it doesn't necessarily mean that the ovarian reserve is that high. Some women, unfortunately, whether they were allocated not that many eggs, or maybe they had something about them that's kind of burned through those a little bit faster. We do know that when the ovarian reserve gets lower, that the risk of miscarriages does increase. It's not skyrockets, but it does increase. It's associated with it. So maybe that doesn't give us something that we can do about it, but it gives us more information and maybe a possible why. We also do a semen analysis. So in a semen analysis, we look at the volume, we look at the uh, concentration, how many sperm, we look at the shape of the sperm, um, we look at also the, the motility and how many are moving. And when some of those numbers are low, that's also associated with miscarriages. So we're talking sperm quality. 
There's no great test for sperm quality. Um, there's a couple other ones that one can do that are honestly associated with recurrent pregnancy losses, but it is something else that we do anyways, and it might shed light on what a couple is going through. Um, so that's the testing. The testing is checking anatomy, okay, with that water ultrasound. Sometimes that leads to, or plus or minus, we just skip right to a, a scope or a hysteroscopy. It's the same day, 20 minute procedure at the most. Um, it's the same day procedure again, like I said, you're in and out about an hour. And it's where we look inside the uterus to look directly. Okay, so we look inside the uterus, we make sure there's nothing that, that could be surgically removed, hopefully, or maybe fixed. We do the blood test we talked about for the genetics, the hormones, as well as the um, autoimmune antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. And that's the majority of the work that we can do. So next, I also wanted to talk to you about the untested testing. And so that's what I call that. If you go online, and I'm sure if you're listening to me, you've already read about this, right? And you've probably read different, you know, just all sorts of different types of information. And you've read about conditions that are associated with current pregnancy losses. A lot of the ones that we are associated with it aren't necessarily ones that are clear enough cut that we should do some treatment for it. So for example, I mentioned autoimmune in the beginning, right? And I think if anyone's done some reading, they might have said like, oh yeah, I've read about natural killer cells, T cells and, and B cells and autoimmune system and, and maybe my husband's sperm or creating embryos, they're not compatible with me. The data out there, no organization, you know, suggests that treatment for that, for natural killer cells, using uh, gamma globulins and IgGs, as I mentioned, um, and, and prednisone and steroids and blood thinners and baby aspirins. In only very select cases, which I'll talk about for antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, that those, the blood thinners have been shown to be helpful. But all the other things are expensive. Sometimes you have to actually leave the country to get them or order them from somewhere else. Um, and they may even be harmful. And so there may be something there about autoimmune. You, the basic science studies have shown some associations with this, some mechanisms that are there, but the immune system is so vast and so complicated and so connected that to take like a huge hammer and just try to shut it all down with IgG or with prednisone or steroids, which can have an effect on a pregnancy, doesn't really work in the long run. And so, um, and in studies that have shown, it has not really been shown to be helpful overall. And so very few fertility places will, uh, will help patients with that. Some will, there are definitely some in some pockets of the country where that people will do that. And if you wanna learn more, you can visit one of those clinics, but just know that it's really something that should be, we, most physicians will say it should be kept to clinical trials. It's worth exploring but it's not something that we should do in clinical practice. We also, people talk about endometrial receptivity and maybe my embryo just can't lock in, that lock and key is not there. Right now, the endometrial receptivity is, it's an orchestra. All different parts play with it, right? That fibroid, those polyps, those are like little toxic factories that can throw that off. And so we can try to look for the big things that may throw that off. But at the molecular level, you know, people will theorize, we'll do some aspirin and do some other factors or some other, um, instill something in the uterus ahead of time that might quiet or try to alter that. That's nowhere near prime time. Um, it's something that's being investigated. And when it comes out in the, you know, the normal way and published and researched, then yes, like let's we'll pay attention to it and, and vet it. But for the moment, we don't have anything for that. We'll also look at, we think about stress, the environment and chemicals. There's no association with normal everyday work stress, right? Or even sometimes even like in war, I mean, right? Assuming that everyone's fed and nutrition is okay, you know, people still get pregnant, you know? Trauma and, se and severe stress, right? There are some links of that, but the sort of everyday stress that we deal with or my boss or I might be leaving my job or I'm afraid about, you know, from other factors that are going on, those, as far as we know, they may have an impact, but we don't feel at all they have a very strong clinical impact. 
That being said, we're advocating for patients to try acupuncture, right? Because that's been shown to help pregnancy outcomes in randomized control trials, many of them, right? We still think that mindfulness or meditation or yoga is going to be worthwhile, not just maybe for your pregnancy, but for you yourself to deal with this, right? Got to take care of the whole person here, not just the uterus. Um, environments, right? We just got to do our best, right? In order to try to reduce our toxic loads for ourselves. I, I don't advocate, you know, for my patients to go around and make sure that every single plastic is going to be like a certain grade or a certain type or, you know, but we are learning more and more about plastics and things in your environment or things in the water, right? And so just do your general best and common sense to try to avoid that. If you deal with a lot of chemicals at work, consult your local, you know, um, uh, OSHA, you know, uh, talk to your doctor about maybe chemicals that you may or may not be exposed to at work. Um, again, some are associated with recurrent losses, but the ones that pop up, you know, where there's enough frequency are those where there's major catastrophes and those kind of seem like a bit more common sense as well. Um, we do think about, just looking one more time, looking at luteal phase defects. Luteal phase defects is something where someone, you know, will say, well, I'm spotting a couple days before my period. That could be sign of a polyp too. Um, so worthwhile, take a look. Um, but a true luteal phase deficiency is hampered by a couple different things. True luteal phase deficiency is that if you know you're ovulating on a certain day and you're bleeding nine days later, something along that lines, that's something's up a little bit strange, right? And whether it's because the lining or because the follicle that is producing the progesterone afterwards may not have been the best, those cells weren't functioning very well. Um, but giving progesterone to patients, trying on their own at home after an ovulation, has been tested and not shown to be very helpful. And so um, luteal phase defects also uh, are hampered because there's no great test for it, right? And so a lot of people will read about, well, I, my, my OB or, you know, my fertility doctor, or, or I just, you know, I gleaned some progesterone from someone else, I saw it, and now I have someone, I'm going to use it. And that has been studied in trials and it really has not been shown. There are, there are cases where progesterone can be helpful for various reasons to protect against miscarriages, usually involving IVF or, or injection IUI cycles. Um, but for the most part, for recurrent pregnancy loss, progesterone is very, very unlikely to be the main issue. Um, and the last thing that we talk about, I like to talk about is insulin resistance. Again, kind of like autoimmune, there's something there but it's not, we will test it. We'll get a hemoglobin A1C, right? If someone has signs of polycystic ovary syndrome, that's another uh, condition that's kind of tends to be associated with recurrent pregnancy losses. It's probably mostly due to the fact that maybe the thyroid is also associated to be off with those of PCOS. Insulin resistance is also known to be off with those of PCOS. Obesity, which is associated with recurrent pregnancy loss slightly, not largely, but slightly, is also associated with polycystic ovary syndrome. And while there might be other factors associated with polycystic ovary syndrome, including androgens and higher levels of that, what we have to do is just do our best to try to get the hormones balanced, right? And try to, but most women with polycystic ovary syndrome have great prognosis too as well. Um, so when we think about, we've now kind of have the reasons why we have what we look for, right? So, and then what we know, right? And what can we do about it is the testing. So then when we talk about the treatments, so anatomic, if you have an anatomical issue, right? That you talk about the uterus, right? So if I have that septum, if I have polyps, little lumps or bumps that are in the lining, if I have a fibroid that's in a location that might hamper, then that typically means surgery. So there's different gradations where that fibroid is will play an important role as whether or not surgery is recommended or not. Um, but for the most part, when we go in doing a septoplasty, which is the official term for kind of repairing that septum or removing it, or doing a polypectomy, polypectomy to remove polypus, polyps and ectomies to remove, then those are pretty simple same day procedures that can make a huge difference for someone, okay? Um, when we talk about um, antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, that acquired um, 
autoimmune acquired thrombophilic condition that hampers the inf infiltration of the placenta and implantation. Baby or aspirin and um, uh, heparin, okay, or Lovenox, have been shown to be helpful to increase the ability of the blood vessels to grow and to try to prevent them from clotting off. So that's the one time that we do feel like doing something along those lines can be beneficial. When we look at the prolactin, we look at the thyroid, we look at the hemoglobin A1C, there's medicines to help deal with that, to try to get them under control, you know, or whether it's weight loss, because if someone's maybe hidden diabetic and obese. So there's ways to go forward on that. Okay. And then the last thing is um, treatment is that some patients, a lot of patients, at least in my clinic, will opt for in vitro fertilization. This is not um, necessarily a straightforward path. Even those who have had two, three, four losses, 35 years old, the majority of those patients with the next pregnancy will be able to get pregnant, assuming that we haven't found something wrong. Okay like 70%, 75%, okay? It can happen too. It may not seem like that if you're the person who's had two or three miscarriages. And so the emotional toll of going through these miscarriages can be very hard. So in IVF, just IVF alone, in order to extract the eggs from the woman, get the sperm from the man, put them together in the laboratory, make sure that they meet, watch them grow, IVF does not increase or decrease the chance of a miscarriage. But if we do genetic testing of that embryo, okay, of those blastocysts, those day five blastocysts, and then we basically grow or create the blastocysts, six or seven small cells are taken from the future placenta of that embryo, and the embryos are frozen. Then these cells are sent off to a laboratory where they do testing to see, does this embryo have the normal number of chromosomes? So probably if we don't find a reason, a lot of the, re the a specific reason in our anatomy, in our autoimmune or in, um, um, sorry, in our other factors that we're looking for in prolactin and labs and in our genetics, if we don't find a reason that a lot of times it's probably due to the, the chromosomes not being balanced. And so we know that in most centers will say, um, and for ours, that if I have a genetically tested healthy embryo, okay, genetically ba balanced embryo, euploid is the term, then the chance of a miscarriage is less than 10% with that one. So five to 8% depends upon which site that you look at or which center you go to. It's not perfect, it's not zero, but it's a lot better than 25, 30%. And so, but a lot of patients with recurrent pregnancy loss don't have a problem getting pregnant, right? And so faster time to pregnancy is sometimes gonna be trying on your own again when your body and your, your emotionally ready and your body's ready. And then majority of time those patients will conceive. But for those who say, I don't wanna do that again, then we can sometimes offer in vitro fertilization with pre-implantation genetic testing of the embryo prior to transferring. And that can reduce the rate of miscarriage and reduce the emotional burden of, and potentially if you're trying to grow your family and having more than one child from the point of IVF when you come and see me in the office, then this might hopefully help reduce the chance of mis recurrent miscarriages with that next child. Unsure 100% on that, we can never, you know, we don't know that crystal ball, but that's also another part that might be helpful, okay? So just looking at my, my notes real fast, um, again, we talk about the treatments to be wary of, right? We talked about, I wanted to say that, you know, what we don't know, but people want to treat, to try to help, right? Make people feel a bit better. Um, we talked about the baby aspirin, steroids like prednisone, um, uh, heparin, we're talking about IV immunoglobulins, looking at me, let's make sure I got everything here. Um, the progesterone in the luteal phase. Those are things that, um, that a lot, some physicians will prescribe, but you know, just want you to kind of think a little bit about that before you go, you know, and before you start going down that path, because it's a rabbit hole. And again, remember I talked about in the beginning, there are some things that you, oh, sorry. Um, there's, I mean, if you're going through all of this, what we hope is that you've been paying attention a little bit to the things that are in your control. 
If you're smoking, you got to stop. If you're drinking alcohol more than say four or five drinks in a week, you got to reduce that. Probably zero is best, but I but I don't really have an association between one or two drinks or small glasses or you know glasses of wine a week are going to play a major role. But in general, we're going to tell you to just cut down and stop. Um, when we also look at coffee, four regular cups of coffee or more a day are associated with miscarriages. I don't know if it's causative, but they're associated with it. So we do tend to have our patients say, you know what? One cup of coffee a day, if you need it, maybe do decaf the rest or some tea afterwards and you'll be fine. Try to keep it under two, um, 200 milligrams of caffeine, which is um, 16 ounces total of home brewed coffee. Okay. Not Starbucks because they, they, they crack it out. Um, but you know, or Pete's, I guess I'm not going to, not bias against a corporation, but any of these coffee places will, you know, crack them out. So you need to make sure that you keep your caffeine to, uh, to a normal level if you need it, which I do. I know I need my caffeine too. So it's okay to have some, but really try to watch it. Um, I think what's also hard, um, is to, and something that's very important to deal with, um, that's in your control, but kind of out of your control is your response to the grief. When we talk about these things, we talk about the pregnancy and trying to get, you know, optimize the uterus and the embryo and, and give you guys the best chance of having a child. But it's two people going through this roller coaster and it's a lot of dips and no one really sees the end when they're in the middle of it. And things that we can do at least can move forward and try to find some information. I used to be an engineer, I like data, like let's know more. Um, but sometimes we still a lot of times don't find a reason. We know how to help still but it's important that if this and i don't know anyone who's gone through this where it's not gotten them or affected how they deal with things and stress it's really important that you take care of yourself and so taking care of yourself will involve um seeing a counselor if you need to mindfulness meditation yoga acupuncture Okay, these are things that can help you deal, right? And as a supportive as your spouse, you, you might be with your spouse, sometimes having that third person and that, that counselor can be really helpful just for a couple sessions maybe, right? And if you realize, no, nah, nah, I'm okay, I got it, then, then so be it, right? But you've tried it. But most people start in it or be like, yeah, no, this was helpful. Like I just, it's good. We know one way, at least in a good trial, was that in patients who are pregnant with recurrent pregnancy loss is to have reassurances, extra ultrasounds to look in, check-ins with their doctor, right? Those have been shown in small studies to help increase the chances of a live birth. Why is that? That's a great question. There is a mind-body connection. We know this, right? And so it's important to explore those parts that are in your control. They're not in your control, but they're in your control. But to, to take those seriously and to listen to yourself during this hard time. Okay. Um, okay. So that's my, that's my talk. Um, I hope you've learned something. Um, I hope you don't mind my amateurish drawings there and the anatomy. I was debating about to put them in, but just to break it up, I think it's probably a good idea. So again, my name is Michael Homer. I'm a reproductive endocrinology and fertility specialist in Reproductive Science Center um, in the Bay Area. I'm located specifically in the uh, San Jose, Silicon Valley area. Um, I wanted to thank, thank uh, Beat uh, virtual summit here, uh, fertility summit for, uh, for hosting this and putting this all together. Um, and I hope everyone learns a lot from the national fertility awareness week. And, um, you know, if you have questions or you're concerned, you're lost, just call your local fertility center up and, um, and, and get some help. Okay. Cause you deserve it. Okay. Take care.